This Week in Startups is brought to you by Dell for Entrepreneurs. Members of Dell for Entrepreneurs get an exclusive 10% off when you visit launch.co slash Dell or email startups at dell.com and mention This Week in Startups. Odoo is a fully customizable and fully integrated suite of software that lets you build and scale your stack as you build and scale your business. Your first app is free forever, and right now Odoo is offering $1,000 off your first implementation pack at odoo.com slash twist. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash twist. And Roman. Erectile dysfunction used to be tough to talk about, but now there's Roman. Go to GetRoman.com slash twist and get $15 off your first order of ED treatment, a free online visit, and free two-day shipping. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I have been looking forward to this podcast for years, and when we finally booked it, for the last 48 hours, I have been absolutely ecstatic because today on the program, my favorite NBA player who has uh, just absolutely blown my mind with what he's been able to accomplish over the last decade. He scored zero points. He scored, he got zero rebounds and zero assists, but he is the player of all players uh, as a general manager. You know him, Daryl Morey, uh, is on the pod today, uh, formerly of the Houston Rockets for the past, I don't know if that was like 12 or 13 year run you had, Daryl, and uh, now 14, 14, 14 year run. Before that, he was at uh, the Celtics under Danny Ainge. Uh, before that, he was in IT fixing uh, network interface cards and Novell Networks like I was in the 90s. Welcome to the program, Daryl Morey. Thanks, Jason. It's an honor to be on, and uh, I'll try to live up to that intro. That's pretty crazy. Do you get an intro, too? Do you get, like, a long intro, too? No, nah, I mean, when I'm on other people's podcasts, you know, they can ham it up. But gotcha. in all sincerity, watching what you did with the Rockets as a long-suffering Knicks fan, to watch the Rockets, which, uh, you know, listen, has a great history. Hakeem Olajuwon was, you know, just one of the greatest all-time NBA players, won two rings, I think. And really changed the game in terms of finesse of a big man. Uh, as the Rockets were, you know, like I don't want to say second tier city, but uh, it's a second, it wasn't like a, a New York, a Boston, or a Lakers. And you somehow were able to have a series of players on that team uh, and then a, an amount of success, which is just. I don't know if any GM has had a run like you had. What 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 are the statistics in terms of your winning percentage in terms of uh, games and stuff like that when you were at the Rockets? Yeah, we had the second most wins of any team advanced uh, in the playoffs more than, I think, two or three teams. Uh, sadly, uh, uh, never had a losing season, but sadly don't have a, don't have a ring. So... Uh, you know, in sports, you're only as good as how many rings you have. So I, I suck. I suck just like the other team. So see, I don't believe that. As a long-suffering Nick fan, I look back on Patrick Ewing and you know Alan Houston and Charles Oakley as some of the greatest moments of my life. Just cheering on and being in those seats when they played Jordan in those series. Uh, you you never drafted a star, but you traded for some of the greatest players, and I I don't know. Do you actually feel like you're a failure if you don't get a ring because so many of the great players had to go through either LeBron or Jordan, and you know, is getting a ring really that uh, the only thing that matters to you? Well, it's a big part of the culture. Um, I would say no. There's there's been a lot of fun, a lot of success. I mean, I think. At the end of the day, you know, as long as you're, you know, life's about happiness, right? So mm. it's been, it was a great run in Houston. I'm excited to be with the Sixers. Mm. But I, I would say, you know, it's it's like the white whale. It's I'm like Ahab chasing the, the white whale, sadly. Let's talk about Simmons. People are saying he's like a jump shot away from being the next LeBron James. I think that's the most craziest thing i've heard people say about him tell me about him 
As well, a player. he's elite. He's elite defensively. He's under age twenty five, already making all NBA teams on the defensive side. All NBA teams overall, top fifteen in the league, and and also you know all defensive teams. He's also an elite passer. I mean, yeah, Simmons is un, unreal. I mean, he 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 has a chance to be a transcendent player. That's why I said it. Yeah, that's what's exciting for Doc and I is Joel for sure could be one of the most dominant bigs of all time, if not the most. And Ben could be one of these super unique players who, you know, throughout history we go, Ben Simmons, there probably won't be another one like him with his combination of skills, uh, a 6'10", mobile perimeter and interior defender can, with handles and pass. Uh, it, it, it rarely, if you're 6'10 and can pass, the advantage you have is so big to be able to see over the defense and, and he's so anyway, he, he's super, super unique. Joel's uh, super unique. Well, I mean, they're also 24 and 26 years old. I mean, yeah, I know it's so awesome. that is the dream is to have <laughs> yes. two players like that who you have, you know, whatever you're, you're, you're going to have six, seven, eight years with them. When do NBA players like hit their peak with in, in terms of the vector of skill and passion and knowledge, I guess if you because I'm not sure what the most important things are for, uh, you know, an NBA player who's that elite, but I think wanting it is a big component of that. And there's something to do with maturity, I would think, yeah. of like, really wanting it and being mature enough to say, this is my window, you know, and what age is the window where the these two players can do their best work? Yeah, players peak in the NBA. There's there's some reasonable debate on how to measure it, but somewhere between 25 and 29. I know that's a big range, but that's that's where no, that makes sense. That's that's where players peak is if you if you measure it. Um, then there are exceptions, guys who peak earlier, guys who peak later. But you know, if you just take it writ large across the NBA and do a, a correct work on the data, it's like 25 to 29. So yeah, no, having having. Ben and Joel in these peak ranges is uh, absolutely incredible. So. Chris Paul seems to be an exception to this. I mean, he had what an outstanding season he had last year. Obviously, you had a bad beat with him getting injured. Why is he such an exception to this that he's still playing such elite basketball at such a you know advanced age? He's ten years older than the window we're talking about. Hall of Famers generally last longer, but you could still argue for his peak being like so like. Hall of Famers like keep their level of play, and I'd say Chris Paul's you know arguably the smartest player I've ever been around. Like he's his knowledge of the game is you know, incredible, like like unparalleled, <laughs> like top five all time for sure. You resigned from the Rockets, so you decided to leave. They changed the management, and I I, I read you know basically you know it's a new boss. Maybe you want to try something else. Everybody thought you're going to take a year off. Bunch of speculation out where I'm from that hey. Daryl's a really smart cat. He understands investing. He understands gambling. He understands risk. He, you know, money ball kind of guy. Maybe he winds up at a venture firm. Maybe he winds up at a hedge fund. Did you actually consider and did you get, I, I know you got offer. So I'm, I'm curious how you looked at the possibility of doing something in an adjacency or was that just Bill Simmons pumping you up? No, I, I, I had to think about everything. This last year has been pretty tumultuous for me with, uh, you know, I sort of took a stand on civil liberties that that, that uh, ended up uh, getting a lot of attention, and there was a decent chance that I might never work uh, in the NBA or sports again. And and then also when I resigned, I thought that I was going to be off for a time, and that maybe that path would be you know blocked for me because of that. And I was quite pleased it wasn't. So I th really thought about everything, like what what do I really enjoy doing, and uh, as you can see, I settled on. I love what I'm doing. So uh, I'm pretty, pretty fortunate to have gotten into it. It was my dream growing up to do what I'm doing. And so, you know, it's always nice to take that step back. You don't get to do it in life and say, you know what, I really love what I'm doing and I want to keep doing it. And, but I didn't know if I was going to be able to, I, I did think I was going to be off for at least a year. Uh, the timing just wasn't normal for me to actually jump on with a team. So. It was pretty cool that the 76ers and Doc and Elm Brand and the ownership there all all thought that I could come in even though it was late in the day and help. 
How fast did they reach out to you after you resigned? Was it just like the next day they're like, hey, listen, we, we need you. Get in here. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty immediate. Yeah, pretty immediate. Yeah. That, that's got to be a great feeling when your phone blows up and you get that text, right? It, it is. It, yeah, you don't know. I mean, I think uh, everyone who's had a long career has been through that moment where you're like, you know what, what's going to happen? Like, what's next? Are pe do people really care? Or are they just saying things while you're, you know, to be nice? Like, there was, there's a big difference between being nice, you know, at, at, you know, at a high level at a party and then, you know, having to say, okay, I really want to invest in this guy and I really want to bring him in. Those are two very different things. And you never know the difference until you get to that moment. It's so true. There's people who will be cordial uh, socially and say, hey, listen, if you ever need a gig or I'd love to collaborate with you and then crickets, if you ever reach out to them. I've had this experience as an investor my, myself. Do you want to have a strong start to 2021? I know you do. I do too. And Dell is here to help you kick off your 2021 right with their year end sale. Yum, yum. Since most of us aren't spending money on holiday vacation this year, why not put that extra cash to good use and upgrade your home office? I did. I am sitting here with this giant 49 inch monitor, powerful Dell computer, so I can play some games and do sick, amazing. DSLR videos and Zoom. You can't do that with the old computers. You need to upgrade and you're going to get 63% off on certain products at Dell.com to check out some of my favorites, the ultra sharp curve monitor. I love these. Give these to everybody on your team and oh my God, yum, yum. The XPS 13 is the Windows amazing long battery life up to eight hours of streaming on a 4K model, the highest resolution possible. This is going to promote teamwork you give new equipment to your team it means so much to them there's never been a better time to upgrade your home office hardware especially with so many of us working from home head over to launch.co slash dell that's launch.co slash dell for an extra five to ten percent off all dell products and while you're there you can sign up for a free it consultation to find out the best solution for your team big or small the Dell team has been amazing to us in 2020 and to the community. So many offerings, so many great products. Looking forward to working with Dell in 2021. Go ahead and go to launch.co slash Dell and get that incredible discount. You know, without getting into super details, because I don't want to get you in more trouble. Uh, you know, I, and I was, my first job was working for Amnesty International, the human rights organization. You took a stand on just, you know, something that was, a, you know, pretty innocuous, uh, but... You, you did you took that stand with uh you know something that could hurt the pocketbook of a lot of people and it was crazy to watch how much heat you got and how little support you got as a as a fan of the league uh you might have seen my tweets uh, and some other people's tweets here in silicon valley i mean we came out strong and we're like listen this is completely crazy we're americans first and foremost we stand for freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and you cannot take an executive, an individual who just takes a moment in the most innocuous way to say American values matter and then blacklist them. This is insane. A friend of mine decided to make t-shirts and the Warriors game were filled with them. H what was that experience like? I don't want to get into details about it, you know, too much here, but just in general, when you're getting that kind of blowback, and you're not getting support, you're getting criticized. What was that period like in your life for you as a human? Yeah, that was the most intense period I've been through. Um, as you mentioned, I've, I've taken a lot, you're a public figure, so am I, I've taken lots of stands. And you do it to support something you believe in. I'm big on civil liberties, especially domestically with the ACLU. But I had many friends in, in that region from business school and they were going through a period where I felt like they needed support. I I didn't, uh, yeah, I, I didn't anticipate what would happen after. I will say, like initially, um, initially, obviously, there are a lot of non-support, but I will say that behind the scenes, there was actually a lot of support uh, publicly. As you mentioned, a lot of the Bay Area got behind me, which I really appreciated. Uh, Tillman Fertitta, who took some heat, he actually was very supportive. Adam Silver was very supportive. And I always felt good that, you know, that I wasn't going to back off my comments. 
and and that uh, you know it was it was a cause you couldn't back off was sort of how I looked at it, and I was going to let the chips fall where they may, and that's sort of scary because uh, you know again I just talked about how much I love what I do, so I thought that those two things may not be congruent, but uh, thankfully thankfully they were, and um, you know I think it's I'm, I'm, it's important for Americans to realize the the very privileged unique position we are in the world to have been born in this country and you know we sometimes get caught up in how this country is imperfect and of course it is it it just happens to be doing a lot better than every other country when it comes to you know these issues and uh if you look at um uh some actors have been banned from certain countries because their portrayals were not in you know, uh, the, to the liking of certain political figures. And, and it's just crazy to think Richard Gere or, you know, Brad Pitt or others can't work in certain places. In what we need to do is rally around the people who take those stances and say, no, no, we're all the same. And I, I was very, very relieved when I saw Adam Silver say, hey, listen, Daryl's one of us. He's incredible, and the NBA stands with him. And it, it felt like it took a little too long, but I think what people have to realize, these are delicate situations. And engagement with, it, it is an open issue if the engagement with certain, you know, uh, groups encourages them to go in the right direction of history and humanity or not. And I, we were faced with it here in Silicon Valley with Saudi Arabia. You know, Saudis came in with a lot of money, and I passed on taking you know, LP money from certain regions. And, you know, um, I have a smaller fund because of it. But I, I like you, I felt like this is just too important. Um, well, it's, uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a big issue. It's only going to get bigger, I think, because you look at, you know, the, the level of integration with manufacturing, uh, with, you know, large uh, entertainment studios that get, get such large uh, funds from, from that region. Uh, it, it's only going to be a bigger and bigger issue over time. And I did appreciate there was, to your point, because it's delicate, there was some initial non-rallying, but then there was a lot of rallying. And in fact, I think it's the only thing that AOC and Ted Cruz have ever agreed on was they both signed a letter <laughs> together uh, backing me, which uh, I'll also remember. That's that. pretty fantastic when you think about it. I think it's we, what we need to see more of in America is For this sure. kind of like, Let's recognize the 98% of what we agree on, which is, you know, the, the basic human right tenets, which Eleanor Roosevelt put into the world in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1949 or 50. Like, we, we've led the world in this concept. We are, we have an obligation to the world to, to continue this. And you, know, you look at somebody like Tom Cruise without pointing fingers at certain people, but th their movies are funded by certain different, you know, regions of the world. And you can't have a villain from that region of the world anymore. It's, it's just crazy to think that a company like Disney is going to pick which, uh, you know, Disney is going to pick who, who, the endings of movies based on how it's going to play in certain regions of the world. It's just. The villains in uh, movies is one of my most interesting thing. The arcs over time when we were kids, there were certain, you know, they're Bond villains or whatever. And, and they, they've had trouble, you know, because, you know, obviously I think it's a good change for racist reasons and stuff. They haven't chosen certain villains that they might have in the past. But now they've settled on that all corporations are villains and everyone can everyone can get a rally around that corporations are horrible. Absolutely <laughs> easy to make rich people the villains. Like, yeah. Yes. If you're a billionaire, we, we you are the villain. Yes. <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. that transcends race. It doesn't have to be a Middle Eastern terrorist anymore. It doesn't have to be a Chinese Big uh, corporations. Terrorist. Big corporations. No Germans, are, Nazis. <laughs> yeah, big corporations are the villains. Meanwhile, I'm filling my Amazon cart and hitting ship to me in, two, in, in 20 minutes and not thinking about the discongruency of those two things. So. Well, yeah, and it's, you know, I, I have this discussion to people about the polarization of wealth in the United States all the time. And when a, when a market becomes global, it leads to products and services becoming global. The NBA is the perfect example of that. What, um, you know, uh, Stern did, uh, Commissioner Stern did in terms of bringing basketball around the world. That actually has made the world understand each other and brought people together 
because you you have people around the world playing basketball and then coming and joining our league, right? I mean, that's one. That is a melting. Yeah, I think pot. our league is twenty five to thirty five percent from non non US born, and uh, it's one of the amazing things about the league. I still think the NBA is easily one of the top few sports in the future among traditional sports. I really think the NBA and uh, and soccer are going to be the ones that that win. And then uh, East esports is going to be huge as well. I wonder why soccer and basketball have become the absolute premier sports on a global basis. What are you? Why is that? I think it's be- well. A, it is global. Um, I would say just the you know the ease of it. You just need a ball. Soccer, you can really understand because you can make makeshift goals and, and things like that. It's so literally to, the fact with soccer that all you need is a ball and a field and you yes. can put two cans of, you know, Coca-Cola as the goal. Whereas with basketball, you do need to have a hoop, whether it's a, you know, a basket of peaches with the bottom taken out or whatever. You, but still, you don't need much. Yeah, that's my non-tested hypothesis. I have no idea. Someone should, someone should Freakonomics that and see if it's real. But I, I oh, think- that's 100% real. Okay, all right. Well, we've this decided. It's got to be a hundred percent real. Think <laughs> about it. When you were, I don't know if you were growing up, but like the idea that my brother wanted to buy hockey, my parents couldn't afford the seven hundred dollars right. in equipment and the three hundred dollars for ice time. It was a thousand bucks for a kid from Brooklyn to be able to go play hockey. It was a non-starter. Football was a non-starter. That was hundreds of dollars in equipment. You know, like what's yeah, left? Yeah, Jason and Daryl agree. QED. It must be true. <laughs> As someone who's invested in over 200 companies, I think it's getting to 250, may have to update the copy. Uh, And I've advised many more. I want to talk to you about a serious pain point, and that is your burn rate. Ask yourself, how much money are you spending on all these different software products out there? And how much time does it take to integrate them all together? Let me guess, way too much. We all know that. Well, Odoo, O-D-O-O, is here to change that. Odoo is a fully customizable and a fully integrated suite of software that lets you build and scale your stack as you build and scale your business. It's simple and modular, so you use only what you need and all of their apps integrate perfectly with each other because they make all of them. Plus, it's all open source, so you can spend your capital on talent instead of expensive software. And your first app is always free, it's free forever, and right now, Odoo has come over the top. We do a lot of offers here. Sometimes people offer a 50, sometimes they offer a hundy. Here we go. First time ever, a thousand. Odoo is offering you a thousand dollars in credit on your first implementation pack. It's not a joke. You're going to get that thousand dollar credit right now. If you go to odoo.com slash twist, odoo.com slash twist, check it out, odoo.com slash twist to get a thou. You're going to get the thousand. You're going to get a dime right in your pocket. Go get it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. We all know the story of Moneyball in baseball. That created a revolution where people were finding underappreciated players or looking at statistics that made you think differently about certain players. This moved over and you were involved in the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. This is something that people maybe aren't aware of. Explain how um, the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference was created, came down, and then how that went through the league and what those early years of Moneyball coming to basketball were like. Yeah, as you mentioned, baseball was first. The game is really lends itself to data and analysis. It still does even more than basketball. And, um, you know, so early on, uh, I actually was trying to work in baseball first. That's In fact, I worked there at Stats Inc. In the, in the early 90s, and then I had played basketball. And my hope what was What did you to- play? You were a point guard? I was, I'm six four, and I'm from a real small area of Ohio, so I was oh, actually sir. the tallest person on the team. Which why well, played should, center? Which should tell you how many games we won. If, if <laughs> your center, if your center is six four in high school, you're you're not winning many games. So, but you played center when you when you put your back to the basket, you had to back people down and then just try to flip it up, right? Patrick I, Ewing and style. I was. And I was very good at that. But uh, unfortunately... Just hit the box, uh, right? <laughs> just hit the <laughs> yeah. box, big guy. <laughs> I wasn't very skilled, so I would just, I would just uh, beat on people uh, at, at my size. So, so the, this, this makes the jump in what year and what was the league like at that time? And how did the league, whether it's players, 
uh, et cetera, look at it because I remember a lot of people were just uh, maybe, you know, sports commentators were like, this is garbage, you know, statistics don't matter. Yeah, 2002 in the NBA, yeah, statistics were pretty non-existent. Some early stuff from John Hollinger and Dean Oliver, some of the pioneers in basketball, but uh, very not very listened to. Some pioneers like Dean Smith uh, on the college level who was doing possession-based analysis and, and things like that. But early on, it was... It was just like baseball was in the the mid the mid uh, '90s, um, and basketball is about ten years behind, and continues to be about ten years behind the evolution of of baseball. And yeah, t- 2002, I was working for uh, the Celtics. That's where I got started, and uh, you know, trying to convince uh, first Jim O'Brien and Danny Ainge, and then Doc Rivers and Danny Ainge about the utility of this, and both were pretty open to it. And so it's pretty cool. Now I'm reunited with doc rivers in, uh, in, uh, at the 76ers. And at the time when I was at Boston, you know, I was teaching a class uh, with Jessica Gelman, who's with the Patriots at MIT. And when I got to job in Houston, we were going to turn it into a weekend seminar, the class and the seminar became a conference just sort of by accident. Mm. And, and some VC started going there. I know my friend Bill Gurley would go there, and, and Bill they started. And Mitch, Mitch Lasky were the two. The, the two yeah. benchmark guys were were there very early. Yes, and that's that hilarious. Ben, Bill Bill looked like he was a like he belonged right to, at six seven or whatever he is. B- so. Bill's a Bill Gurley is a tall guy and it speaks <laughs> at a certain pace. We we have a that was the worst po- Bill Gurley impression I've ever heard. Well, I get what you're trying to. Say. <laughs> we we play poker every week, and so I came up with my outrageous Bill Gurley. Oh gosh, <laughs> he's this uh, is Bill Gurley. This he's is Bill lost Gurley when he has the Texas accent. He's lost. This is it. Bill Gurley when he's got the nuts at the game. Well, <laughs> I guess sometimes you got to make a stand. I'm all in, and then like, he turns over quad, straight flush, whatever. It's pretty That's hilarious. Awesome. I've heard about so, this poker game. Is it is it like Molly's game, or what are we talking? Well, about? you know, it's interesting. I got invited to Molly's game when I lived in LA a lot, and she'd be like, "Oh, Toby's here. Oh, Leo's here. They really want to see." You. I was like, "They want to see Jason Calacanis lose fifty grand. They don't want to see Jason Calacanis. I don't give a shit about Jason Calacanis." And I didn't go to those games because at that time I was playing with my friend Kevin Pollock, the actor, in his $200 buying game, which was hilarious because all of like, you know, Kevin Pollock's friends, J.K. Simmons one time, you know, uh, J- Jimmy Woods. I mean, it was like the most incredible poker game to ever be at because it was half celebrities, half writers, Jim Brooks from The Simpsons. It was great. Our poker game's a little bit higher, uh, but not crazy. But it's just good friends, you know, good friends talking shop, and it really does. It's like a great way. What are for, this, what, for, what stakes are we talking? I've just heard about that. I know, uh, I know, so I know Draymond, we, Draymond plays in it sometimes. Draymond plays. He's a great guy. I want to talk a little about Draymond. We, we, we keep it relatively small so nobody gets hurt. There were people who were trying to raise the game up, but it's, uh, I can say, like $100, $200 poker. So you can play in it for four figures no problem and not you guys should uh, you guys should uh, put equity in just to, to make it more fun that would be interesting i mean it, it is when you play in a poker game you know every week with this group of people it, it's kind of surreal because it's just a, a collection of real winners like who are also very intelligent at the top of their game so the conversations get really interesting what was the first statistic that you discovered that gave you an epiphany or that was applicable and and then how does one take an epiphany or something they see in the data and then get a basketball player who's getting paid 20 million dollars who let's face it maybe has their own opinion of how the game is played since they are an all-star how do you get that data observation onto the court that's a great question. Obviously, it's the hardest part. I think for those who saw Moneyball, and I think a bunch of people have seen it because Netflix decided to put it in their catalog and shove it down everyone's throats over the last month. Um, but great movie. And they talk about uh, getting on base, right, as the mm-hmm. first sort of, you know, disruptive stat for baseball. You know, Bill James knew that in 1979, but it took till... It took till the the Red Sox uh, and the A's and Tampa Bay really really pushed those uh, where the teams that really pushed it early in basketball. Yeah, it was very early on. I was with you know Mike Zarin who I hired. He was 
he was actually uh, out of Harvard Law, and he's still at the Celtics. And and we were looking at this, and and we were looking at yeah the the locations of where people shoot and how efficient they are. Hmm. And if you if you it's sadly you know like that sometimes the best innovations are the most simple, right? And baseball was just getting on base. It defeats not getting on base. Real shocking insight. They call uh, that on base percentage. Am I correct? They I'm do. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. So getting on base is a prerequisite to getting a home run, and home runs are what win games. So well, the big you, key in on base, because I started in baseball, is yeah. actually less getting on base and more not getting out. So like ah, wait, hold yes. on a second. So the strikeout ends the inning. So getting on base doesn't end the inning. Am I correct? Yeah, yes, yeah, that's the getting on base means you didn't get out. So actually, it turns out the key innovation is not getting on base, it's not getting out. Now, those two things are two sides of the same coin, of course, but yeah. people don't think about them as the same. But yeah, if you're getting on base, you can't get out. So getting on base is is why that's that's you only have three scarce things, you have three outs. So anyway, going back to basketball, yes, um, and you're if you're looking at the data, which obviously. <laughs> Uh, we were early at, at the Celtics. Um, and it turns out if you look at the data for more than five minutes, you say, wait a minute, there are these certain shots. People talk about three-pointers and, and rim shots as being efficient, but it's similar to getting on base it, where it's not getting out. In basketball, it's not threes and rim shots. It's don't shoot these shots between them that aren't very good. And and if you look at that, the other thing that people miss and was felt like an insight, uh, now it's pretty basic, is if you go two for six from three-point land, it's the same as getting three for six from two. You score six points on six shots. But it's important to note that on the three-pointer version where you're going two for six from three and scoring the same, you have an extra miss, which you might rebound. So it just – it actually – it actually gooses oh, the... Oh, wow. Hold on a second. I, I see what you're saying. The extra miss gives you a 33% more uh, advantage in getting a rebound, which is a second shot. And do long shots have long rebounds as I was... Turns, out, when, to, turns out no. Yeah, no, I mean, that's not re- true. Not true. You remember them because they fling off the rim. You go, oh my God, and then he got a run out. And coaches <sighs> remember that. But it turns out, no, the distribution of a 24-footer is very similar to a 12-footer. It's almost identical. Um, and who, which player was the first to kind of – which player and which squad was the first to sort of take this and run with it? Uh, was it you or was it, was it D'Antoni and, you know, what he did with that seven seconds or less? And how, how did that play into it? Was he also at these conferences and have his own version of this? Yeah, I'd say a lot of people sort of dabbled in it. Like they sort of fell into it because I've talked to those teams that were early innovators, like Mike D'Antoni was our coach later in Houston. And also uh, actually Stan Van Gundy's Orlando team mm. in the late the late aughts, however you say yeah. it. Um, both those teams looked very modern. They had, they had floor spacing, lots of threes. Uh, but if you actually go back and talk to Mike, talk to Steve Nash, talk to the key people on those teams, Jameer Nelson, who works for the Sixers now. Their personnel were sort of driving that, but no one was like saying, let's move that direction. In fact, Mike, who came to the MIT conference, I think in 2008 or 2009 when he was between jobs, you know, he just said he like felt right, but if he had mm. had the data, he would have pressed it more. So Nash, Nash has looked at everything and said like, boy, I would have shot way more if I played now. And he should have. He was like he and uh, he and Steph Curry, the two you know best shooters of all time, based on the data we have, and and Nash just never shot like like Steph, um, and he should have. That's so unbelievable. And I remember my Knicks had this guy Steve Novak, and yeah, we drafted that we had Novak. A- that was actually my first draft pick in Houston. Was it? See, now yes. this was incredible because. There was this little moment, just tiny bright spot we had in the last 20 years, you know, since Sprewell and Camby and the Ewing era ended uh, with the loss to in the shortened season, the 50 game season to uh, the Spurs. Um, we, we just had this like 
one glimmer of hope, which was when Steve Novak was put in, you put the three-point splash specialist in, and then you got Carmelo Anthony, who everybody's got a double team because he's a scoring machine. And this kid would just hit 40% or something, but they would never put him in the game. And I'm like, why are we not running the offense through this fucking guy? I was like, literally wanted to throw my TV out the window. It would be hard to run the offense through Steve, although he had more game than people remember. He was actually running off screens and doing a lot of uh, J.J. Reddick type stuff at Marquette. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, he, he he's not really like a real creator. He needs to be working with a Jeremy Lin or someone who can get who can get him the ball. My favorite Steve Novak story. This is the most obscure part of your podcast right now. Is he would he would work really hard, but it was on his shooting because that's his bread and butter. So. We had a shooting gun, and the reason he didn't play more, Jason, is obviously defense. Mm -hmm. And so his own, his own agent one time was like, Novak keeps calling me that you guys need to buy him a better shooting gun, and I keep telling him that he needs he needs a charge taking gun, <laughs> like he needs to <laughs> he needs to work on that side of the ball. And he was probably right. That's why. I and if he him. had just gotten ten or twenty percent better at defense, oh yeah, would he have he been would. like the the Steph Curry kind of level? No, <laughs> he would have, he, I uh, like, he was probably a little bit behind Ryan Anderson. who was one of the best versions of the shooting four uh, that we had in Houston. Um, yeah. I think Ryan might be one of the most elite of the, the Novak sort of type player. Um, and then and, uh, the, the, the Carmelo Anthony's of the world get caught in this little trap between the, two, the paradigm shift. And as they say in, I remember in psychology, when I was a psych major, they said, listen, paradigms don't die, people do. I think and, that's right. That's 100% right, by the way. Yeah, like you just, you, some people cannot just accept the new paradigm. So if you're Freud, you're not going to get into Skinner and behaviorism. And then you, if you're a Skinner, you're not going to get into cognitive. And, and Carmelo Anthony seems to have had this, he seems to be the player who got caught in the paradigm shift. Is there any other player you can think of more who just got caught between these two moments? I would say Carmelo has really adjusted well. He, had, he actually had a really good year with uh, Portland he has last adjusted. year. I would say it's the bigs that have had the biggest mm. paradigm shift. So like the a Roy Hibbert type player. To me, they're like the, the dinosaur that's mm. roaming across the, the plains while the velociraptors are coming to... Uh, to take them down. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's a, the, the real question, Jason. And I always think to myself is like, what will be the paradigm that you and I can't accept? Cause I, both of us are pretty forward thinking guys, but there's going to be one that you, even you and I can't, you know, allow into our brains probably. Well, I mean, it, the, the, uh, I don't know what they call that league where three play, three players play three on three, like the big um, three. Yep. The big three. Okay, there it is. Yep. They added that four-point shot. Now, that seemed oddly compelling, that big three league with that four-point shot. We hear this all the time coming up with the NBA. Do you think there is a, ch a chance, and when this comes up in the discussions, because you're a GM, this must come up all the time. Uh, maybe it's in the owners and you don't get to go to that, or do you get to go to that? And when they talk about four-point plays, what is the reaction? It would ruin the game or it'd make the game turn into NBA. What is that video game? Uh, 2K or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You're thinking of NBA Jam or something. NBA like Jam, that. right? The yeah. Hot streak. Yeah, ex exactly. So uh -huh. the four point shot wouldn't change basketball that much. It turns out like just in the way, like if you just put it at 40 feet or something, um, you know, you're, you, you could shoot it. It would change a little bit of the end of game dynamics. But my guess is just knowing the data, the four point shot would be similarly efficient to the three point shot at 24 feet. Uh, what, what probably would help the NBA is if the current three point shot became worth four and all two point shots became worth three. That would actually balance the game because right now. Oh, it's, right. That would make it only 33% more. Yeah. That would, it would, right now, the, uh, the sort of, uh, percentage trade off between those two is a little bit off. I, I do not think this is something that the NBA will adopt, and nor am I not necessarily recommending it. It's just it's just a fact that the three pointer being worth fifty percent more is uh, is is not necessarily good for the game. All right, listen, it's awkward, it's embarrassing, but gentlemen, we need to talk about ED, erectile dysfunction. Okay, 
you knew these ads were coming. You knew they were coming. Usually we just brush it off, we blame ourselves, but Roman is here to give you that great advice that you need with no shame. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for ED, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. A healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan and if medication is appropriate, Roman will ship you real medicine with free two-day shipping. And the whole process is simple, straightforward, and discreet. And it has to be discreet, right? You don't need people knowing your business. Erectile dysfunction used to be tough to talk about, but here we are. We're talking about it. We're putting it right out on the table. ED, erectile dysfunction. You do not need to suffer. You just need to go to roman.com slash twist and get $15 off your first order of ED treatment and a free online visit. It's super simple and it's free two-day shipping. Go ahead and go to getroman.com slash twist for $15 off your first ED treatment, a free online visit, and free two-day shipping. Do you think the game now is being, I don't want to use the word ruined, but there is, you know, people in our era of basketball who grew up watching the 80s and the 90s and the idea that Alonzo Mourning or Patrick Ewing would play or Jordan would play for a second team when they when they send Ewing to the Sonics, we basically lost our minds as New Yorkers. Like it was, it, it almost made you want to cry to see Patrick. I mean, I literally physically felt sick seeing Patrick Ewing in another uniform. Uh, and and here we are, where the greatest player in the game right now, LeBron, has been on one, two, three teams, and he's he's done f two stints in Cavs, so he's been on essentially four teams, and then he's going to go to the the Knicks with his son to to close it up, from what I understand. So he'll play for five, four or five teams, or four or five stints. Is this making the game more interesting or less interesting in your mind? The players. I think moment? more. I mean, I think it's just a general acknowledgement that the players are the product, uh, and I think the NBA's been the first league to lean into that. I do think to to our point on paradigm shifts or whatever i think it's hard but if you if you take really anyone under 30 they're rooting for the players and they sort of follow the players mm. between the teams more than they're rooting for the teams and it is, if you look at esports and you look at uh you know streaming on twitch and whatever thing it's it's really become more where you are rooting for uh an individual who you get behind who you you like their humor their ideas how skilled they are things like that. And, and that, that is more portable. And I think, I think it's honestly folks like you and I, who, you know, were excited that Mark Price played as nearly as well, you know, with the Cavs for all his important years um, is, uh, you know, something that's exciting to you and I, but I don't think the younger fans, which the NBA has really cultivated well, care as much about that. Let me ask you about my, my, my friend Draymond. A lot of people are like, Draymond is just lucky because he plays with Steph and Clay. Other people are like, this guy is a transcendent leader and just an amazing player. What, what does this uh, wild card of Draymond Green, who is, you know, has so much energy, will stand up to anybody on the court, incredible on defense. I think he's a great passer and he can shoot uh, relatively well. What, what makes him so special? Is he overrated, underrated? How I think he's think underrated, underrated. He's amazing. Um, what makes him amazing? Well, I'm scarred. I mean, he 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 took yeah. us out as much as any player on the Golden State teams who beat us, I believe, five times. And yeah, right, listen, playoffs, which is, you brought it up, so let's let's go there. <laughs> Tell me. Well, let me about let me finish. Words. Draymond. Like, yeah, Draymond. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why he's so good. So I would say the quintessential skill that Draymond can do that maybe is underappreciated unless you're someone in my job, he can guard the rim and at the same time guard a three point shooter in the corner on the same play. Uh, let's say a guy's driving straight at the hoop. He can essentially either stop that drive or, or get them into uh, a difficult shot such that they want to pass to the corner. He can still make the close out to the corner at 22 feet. That's someone I don't know. I've ever seen anyone else who can do that. Very, very few, uh, and that's an amazing skill in today's NBA. Because you have this three. Because you have the. It's almost like he is the super. 
hero or in a way super villain villain to the james harden of the world who's so specialized in hitting a three and also so deft at getting to the rim yeah he's almost the perfect modern the nemesis big, the perfect modern big. Ah. um and, and he's competitive and yeah so you know we used to play a game in houston which was which player because they had like four or five depending on how you're counting amazing players which is really unfair for the rest of the league i'm not complaining or maybe i am well i mean they had steph they had clay you had draymond and then of course kd put it over the top but even without kd you did have uh Iguodala, who seemed to have very high iq and I, I i don't know if harrison barnes was super high iq or not but he he did seem very thoughtful I mean, conversations i've had with him he seemed very smart i don't know if he was a great basketball player or not was he Iguodala? Oh, yeah. Iguodala is, a, yeah, extremely good. That's why Kerr, the year that we almost beat them in 18, uh, I think Coach Kerr correctly points out that Iguodala is out. No, we obviously had multiple players out as well, and Bob Mute and Chris yeah. Paul. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, my point is the game we would play in Houston is like, what, if we could take one player off Golden State, who would we mm. take off? And it's actually. Oh. An extremely hard answer, and no one could agree. Uh, okay, but, well, let's uh, take it through. What was the best argument you heard for taking Steph? Best argument you heard for taking Draymond? Best for taking Clay? Or I whoever. think it would take too long. But what I to answer that? But what I will say yeah. is, I generally would answer Draymond, and I'm pretty sure. And everyone told me I was wrong, but uh, he he was the unique element that was that no other team had that we when we played them that that's mm. hopefully not taking anything away from the other great players you mentioned it, the, what, what's exciting is they were like an amazing cohesive unit uh fit together very well by that golden state organization and unfortunately we didn't beat them let me ask you about passing the ball in the league there seems to be this uh correlation between ball movement and how many people pass the ball just as a fan i mean i guess i'm a super fan of the nba let's be honest it always seemed to me that the warriors would take that extra pass or two almost like unnecessary number of passes and is that a strategy for success or is that just something that i'm perceiving as a, as a neophyte who doesn't understand understand the game as well as you you said the most important word which is correlated so yeah mm -hmm. if you correlate number of passes to efficiency on offense you'll you'll find some some really positive things mm -hmm. uh, causality there is really hard to tease out um so i'm gonna i'm gonna have to give you like a non-answer on that i do think there's a lot of like sort of uh systemic effects that are positive that uh you know coach kerr for example uh pushes that a lot so does coach rivers so there are some like larger uh, sort of positives and psychology that come from that, but they're very hard to tease out of the data. Mm -hmm. um, all that said, I do believe they're there. It's just hard to know how much emphasis to put on it. Most of the time in my job, it's not, is this true or is that true or is this important or is that important? It's like, how much more important is each one? If that Interesting. Makes sense. Because you're managing human beings who have to execute 82 times a year. And so we know this when we're working with founders of companies like you can or those founders are working with their management teams and there are 20 things that make a company successful but we can only keep two or three things top of mind and what i'm reading into when you say the passing and the correlation is there are other effects and i'm going to guess here that one of the effects is that teams that tr players that trust each other and work better together pass more and that teams that don't trust each other, or maybe there's some lack of trust, or maybe just they're not as tight with each other. Maybe they don't pass as much, and therefore that is the success is the 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 team spirit. Am, am I reading into that yeah, psychology? It, uh, uh, that's a factor. There's also a team construction element. So if you have Novak, uh, like we did, uh, there are players who aren't really going to, or passing isn't their skill. They're just there to be field goal kickers, as we call them. So Novak's the ultimate field goal kicker. He waits until the ball comes. If he gets it, he shoots it, he makes it. Uh, so we call them field goal kickers. It's hard to play a, a high pass move offense with, with players like that. What's most important, and you're much better at 
team, you know, non, non NBA, like Silicon Valley type team construction than me. What makes, what matters the most is having something that all fits together. The people, the Mm. strategy, the systems, the incentives that go with it, how you're reaching the customers, all of them have to sort of fit together and Mm. then you have success. And like the way the Warriors built, built their team, obviously supremely successful, probably the best team of all time. Uh, we built our really? team our way. Yeah. yeah, the data would say for sure, for sure, not adjusting for time period. Golden State is the best team ever. I don't think it's actually particularly close. What do you now, think, the Kevin Durant? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no. What I was going to say, like where where people have a legitimate debate is like relative to their era, are they the best team ever? That's more of a debate. But if you were just to say, can I pick any team from history? There was an NBA regular team, not like a dream team or whatever. Yep. You would Golden State's team at their peak, you know, would win pretty handily. They'd win. They'd beat like the Bulls teams in the 90s by like 15. Yeah. And and those teams did not have the advanced analytics. They were playing with the Correct. different rule set. So it's kind of hard oh, to. Oh, it's like, it's not even yeah. fair, right? It's, like it's not saying, even fair, right? Yeah. It's like saying Usain Bolt would beat, you know, a sprinter from, from 1982. Yes, he would. Yeah. Without the, without the recovery and training and analytics, all these things have slowly, every year, the, the league gets smarter. So Correct. what is the, I mean, I, I'm asking you about your edge right now, uh, which you can't give because you don't want other teams to have it. But over the last couple of years, you know, now that we know three pointers, 50% more, you know, uh, mid range jumpers, they're disastrous for a number of reasons. What is the collective wisdom over the last two or three years of what is the edge in playing the game? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the un- enduring edge since the NBA started in the 40s is, you know, having these elite players. We have more elite players. Our elite players matter more than any other of the major professional sports. The way I describe that is, you know, take uh, maybe the best hitter of all time, Mike Trout, you can argue for, Barry Bonds at his peak. Um, and basketball is like after they go up to hit and they hit a home run, uh, it would be like if Barry Bonds could say like, oh, wait, I'm still the best player. I'm going to go hit again. There's no lineup. So if you mm-hmm. have Joel Embiid and he's dominating in the post and he comes down and, and you know, dominates the guy he's on, you come down the floor again, you don't, you're not required to rotate to someone else. You can go to Joel <laughs> Embiid again. Yeah. The other thing is our players play both ends and there's only five on the floor. So our elite players matter. So the enduring advantage in the NBA are these elite players. And then there have been pockets of areas where you can create an edge, like with shooting, like we talked about. And there have been some some other ones recently that aren't as aren't as public now. So I mean those those edges erode, but the endor the enduring advantage of the NBA are having these ten to twenty elite players out of the four hundred forty that how are much playing. better are the top ten than let's say 30 to 40 you know like that cohort of people it's like it's asymptotic they're not even on the same scale really yeah you can't even compare them really and then the top 10 to the top 20 to 30 or the top 10 to the next 10 yeah i mean it's 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 basically like an asymptotic chart i wish i could throw it up where (laughs) you know you get you get into a pretty flat area somewhere around you know 18 to 25 where you know the drops are very shallow after that the, there's like there's probably 20,000 players you know in the world who could be the 12th guy in an NBA team like really? the, the difference between the 12th guy in an NBA team and a top player in the G League and the top two or three players on all the elite teams in Europe are non negligible there's probably slightly better than the NBA but not a big difference so my hope that my Knicks will ever be able to get out of this tailspin are my own delusion because I'm watching the game last night going, oh my God, I love this guy, Obi, and RJ looks better. Uh, there, the, Knicks no will, the Knicks will always have a chance because it's, it's a city that players want to play in. And yeah. so I think macro-wise, you know, the Knicks will 
I mean, this is just to be totally honest. This whole discussion is a front for me to build a relationship with you because I am literally working the next 10 years to get enough of a down payment on the Knicks. And then I'm going to circle back around with you and be like, Daryl, please, please come to the Knicks. Can you imagine if you and I were to get the Knicks to the finals and win a championship, what that would mean for New York? I'm Are trying to, man. I'm just focused on the 76ers. Of course you are. Now, Let's so. do that right now. Tell I will say about, Philly fans yeah. are awesome. They remind me of where I grew up in Cleveland. Just completely delusional and, and psychotic for their teams, which I love. So, How does one deal with, uh, when you're constructing this team, players who maybe have great moments and great potential, but who just don't take it seriously. We had a player on the Knickerbockers named J.R. Smith. And, you know, he he had these moments where you just felt like this guy could be, you know, an all-star if he could just stop untying people's shoes on the free throw line. And I, I'm well, sitting there as an NBA and I'm just looking, that we're paying this guy how much money to untie people's shoes during an actual NBA game. First off, it's NBA champion J.R. Smith, so... Uh, he's got to get okay, a little I guess respect. I can't. <laughs> I got to put some would, respect on his name. I, I would say, you know, not talking specifically about Jr. But if okay, you think we'll about take him it, off the table. Yeah. How 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 often will the bell curve of the physical attributes needed, the drive needed, the intelligence needed? How often are they going to all overlap? So you're most likely going to have a talented player who might not have the drive, or you're going to have a you know a highly skilled player who might not have the athleticism needed. You know, it, mm. it's very – when they do all overlap, that's where you get the top 10 to 20 players in the NBA. But the reality is most of the time those bell curves aren't going to all overlap on the right side of the Z, <laughs> the right side of the bell curve. So. What What do you do internally as a team? Do they have like – like, you know, again, putting J.R. Smith way off. We're not talking about him anymore. But just in general, like the psychology of this is so important. How does the NBA behind the scenes or, or how do teams behind the scenes – manage you know the emotions of the players the the trials and tribulations of just being a human on planet earth which can affect them kevin love's been very uh you know incredible leadership talking about mental illness in his case depression um how do nba teams deal with that because you you're on the road for all this amount of time you're you're very young you're given a hundred million dollars you're given 50 million dollars whatever it is it, and that gets in your head that's got to get in your head. How do the NBA teams work with them? Do they have counselors? Do they have therapists? Are they, or do you just, you're at arm's length because you can't get that personally involved in somebody's life? The answer is yes, a lot of resources. I mean, I think you, you, you've been around successful people and not successful people and, uh, and mental health is, is super important. But I mean, step one is, yeah, they have to say they want, they want change. They want help. Um, so teams in the NBA have done, I think, a really good job, uh, including our teams, of providing those resources, but um, and encouraging it and setting up the environment where that's uh, easy and important. Uh, but it, but at the end of the day, you know, it's 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 sort of Jerry Maguire. Like we're, we're we have to say, help us, help you. Often, uh, mm -hmm. when guys are struggling, it's often hard to to reach them. You know, based on maybe the people in their ear, the their habits, all these kinds of things can often can get in the way of them getting the help they need. But the NBA's had a lot of strides, and again, I credit Commissioner Silver on this in in you know making sure the teams are providing those resources, and and the league and the players' union are providing those resources. It, it is something that's very pronounced in our industry as well, because we've had, I mean tragedies of people killing themselves we've had people may have mental breakdowns and you know we've really tried to provide that resource to ceos because people forget how lonely it is to be elite because it, there's very few people you can relate to everybody around you you have to worry about the agenda are they trying to get close to power for money or f what is their motivation to be close to either a superstar whether it's a superstar ceo an elite player etc and you know, it's asking for help is hard, right? I mean, it's just well, yeah, hard for and then you people. have to realize that the the people who make it there are generally have probably some some quirk <laughs> to. And I won't say a mental problem, but some would call it that. Like they have some quirk that makes them like 
incredibly driven or yep. incredibly, you know, out of the norm and how they think. Um, it's, it's, it's super rare for someone to make it to those heights that, that you've seen at the companies you've been a part of and helped found and everything where they're just, you know, they're doing normal things prior to that. It almost, it's it almost never happens. Um, it, stewards, stewards don't do very well. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about it, it's there, there is some reactor inside of people, right? And I always tell people like, sometimes it's that pressure that makes the diamond. And, you know, you look at the child, I mean, you show me a great founder in our industry, I will show you f four out of five times a parental relationship that was not optimized. Correct. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, no, I had, a, I, I mean, I, had, uh, my parents were so we all had some flaws in our parents, but my parents were solid and together, but I had a, I had a rough, I, I didn't get along with people when I was a kid and I had a rough childhood. I'm sure many, 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 many people have had that, 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 that you're around and it actually can be a positive thing. They're, uh, they're not testing for cannabis this year. This is a good thing in the NBA. Uh, I saw Steve Kerr was a very big proponent of cannabis because, you know, listen, if you've got pain, Back in the uh, the old era, the, the there was a lot of people. I think uh, Alonzo Mourning suffered from this. He was taking all this Adderall. And Patrick Ewing, these guys were taking all this ibuprofen. It was screwing up their kidneys. Uh, and then people started to get onto opioids, and people were taking Vicodin and all this stuff. That's that's been a big change this year. Yeah, no, I think the the NBA and the players' union have done a really good job. Our players are super healthy, and like the bubble was a great environment in that. You know, really, all we had to do is focus on basketball. Guys were getting sleep who don't normally get sleep. I mean, it was actually really <laughs> no clubs to go to. <laughs> yeah, good environment. I would say on cannabis. I mean, I, I you know, I, I leave it to the league how they're doing that, but it does seem pretty hard to to uh, you know something that's legal in a bunch of states seems like a, a tough one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tell me about the bubble. And what that experience was like. You were in it, and were you in it for how long? And I was in it. I wanted to be in it longer because uh, that would mean the the Rockets made it farther. Um, <laughs> it was good. It was it was it, you know it was like a pure play in basketball. You know, uh, it probably wore it wore on me mentally pretty heavily. But um, you know, I'm I'm pretty good at getting through those things. But it, it definitely made me think a lot and. Uh, you know, uh, was sort of made me contemplate what my next what my next steps were. I was hoping it was going to be after we won the title. We were up one zero on the Lakers, and you know that was probably the the height of our uh, excitement before you know they uh, they beat us four straight. So that was a little frustrating. Given this conditioning that we've seen, it used to be big men would be done around 35 and guards might make it to 38 or something. Just my, well, those outsiders. are like, those are top, top players. Most players yeah. and much earlier. Like if you make it to the early thirties in the NBA, you've, you've been, you're a good player. Like you've been above average. Yeah. How, how long can what most people consider one of the, you know, Mount Rushmore's how, how long can LeBron continue to perform at this level? Because, Everybody talks every year about, hey, you know, what let's get, I mean, have less gas in the tank, blah, blah, blah. And, and it, 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 he looked like peak LeBron this year. Yeah, he's already breaking everything. Uh, he's a little like Nolan Ryan, where he's already, like, if you look at historically players of that age, he's already like multiple standard deviations out of the norm. Yeah, of the ones who even make it to that age, which means you're already talking mostly like near Hall of Famers or Hall of Famers. So, um, yeah, he's uh, he's amazing. <laughs> he's he's to me. He's, he's I get in trouble. He's easily the best player ever. It's not it's not even an argument at this point. He's not. And if Jordan had to go up against him, even though Jordan had a better record in the finals, it just it's a different era, right? I mean, a, a Jordan plus the same squad versus LeBron plus the same squad equals LeBron wins. You mean uh, this year's Lakers versus the, one of those Bulls teams from? from well, the I was 90s? thinking even more of an intellectual, like sort of what if, like if you could put LeBron on that, if you could swap LeBron and Jordan on the same Bulls team, and the, they played each other with Pippen as their number two, et cetera, and Rodman as their number three, or you put, you know, Jordan next to Anthony Davis and LeBron, and they and you could simulate that in a simulation. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's hard to, see, but yeah, I mean, LeBron is. Probably, yeah. I mean, I mean, he. It's uh, my favorite ways they they put LeBron down is that he made it to a few finals he didn't win. Like it's worse to make it to the finals and lose than it is to lose in earlier rounds, uh, which is really insane. But yeah, if you you stack it up historically, it's 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 not even particularly close at this point. What do you think about this season uh, and how it's going to play out? We're obviously here. You know, I, last night I was watching the Nick game and uh, it was an empty stadium. Uh, but obviously we're going to have to deal with some players are going to get Corona. They're out in the real world. It's going to happen. We got the vaccines coming. W what's the league's outlook for this year? Because they only announced the first half of the games. Possibility we go back into a bubble maybe even? Yeah, I'm pretty optimistic. I mean, we're we're shooting for 72 games and then playoffs. And, you know, I think uh, the good thing is the NBA has done a really good job with protocols. I get, I get tested every day. We're like in sort of an external bubble right now. Um, and, the, you know, I think I think now that we know how it transmits, it transmits in small yeah. rooms without masks. And uh, now that we know how it transmits and the testing we have in, I think creating a safe environment is possible and actually just navigating all the different state and, and city rules is honestly one of the most challenging things but i think we're going to get all 72 in and then the playoffs yeah they haven't they haven't said how those are going to be done well i mean if the playoffs the playoffs are scheduled to hit at the same time the the may june kind of situation yeah i think it's gonna well maybe i think we're about shifted off a month right now so i think they're Normally start in April, yeah, they're going to start in May, which means it'll probably end closer to the end I mean, of July I, than June. I, I did the math on this. You know, we, we've had about 100 million people who've already had COVID in the United States because for every person who gets tested and is positive. Is that right? Before, well, I, I mean, it, I the, the, the official number is like 15, 16, 17, oh. you know, going up every 200, but that's of people who've been tested for right. it. So, it's so you're, in, you're imputing, you're imputing a larger number. Yeah, I haven't seen yeah. That. So that it's makes gotta sense. be seventy five, and then you got a hundred people getting the vaccine in the first hundred days, and obviously well, if, it's, get a, a if shot. it's that many, then yeah, we'll, we're gonna get through this quicker. Yeah, I mean, I think that, and then the people who will get it will be at risk. I think it's just gonna go from this peak of three or four thousand people dying a day right down to two hundred in March or April, and we're gonna very quickly sort of get to the YOLO and the. Well, it's very days. bad right now. Hopefully, we. Uh, we get it. We get things cleaned up in our hospital systems pretty quick because right now it's sort of bad. Obviously, well, who are the most underrated? And we'll end on this. Who are the most underrated players when we look at this? You know, last decade of players. Uh, we we talked about obviously Draymond Green maybe not being fully appreciated. Who else isn't fully appreciated in 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 this time in this era? Um. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you mentioned Iguodala, I think, is a is a good one. Um, a very, I love very the fact that Miami backed up the truck for him for those last two years. That was nice to see him get paid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's he's a very smart guy. He probably he's probably in your circles. I know he was not uh, really. He don't play cards. Uh, I met him a couple times, but you know, he does invest, and he he's very smart. I mean, yeah, very. <laughs> Bogut's good. We we're good friends with Bogut too. We play cards all the time. We've been friends. He's Bogut good. and I. Bogan and I went through a similar thing of uh, getting called names by the Asian region. So, so <laughs> yeah, well, he's pretty pretty outspoken. You, what what, what Bogut was a pretty elite passer, uh, efficient on the court. Yeah, extremely good rim protector, great passer. Um, yeah, I think at his peak, he was underrated. Absolutely, yeah. um, I do think he, he's someone where uh, the game changed enough because uh, a big mm. who's not mobile on the perimeter gets hard and that yeah, one he had a problem with his ankle yeah he had challenges yeah he was yeah well known but we were trying to trade for bogut when he got traded to the warriors that first time so what do you think of poor zingas we you know this was heartbreaking for me as a knicks fan to watch him get traded but obviously he was you know um you know, got a lot of injury issues but is is, is that like the prototypical person who will lead the league into the next era you know seven plus footer who can shoot threes or is it more like the lucas the ben simmons you know the people who are you know maybe six eight nine ten who can do it all the so, answer is yes yeah. so the, the issue 
what's going to get valued more over time is skill. So ability mm. to dribble, move, shoot, shoot in different types of actions, pick and roll, mm. um, you know, transition, things like that. Uh, and, and then mobility are the ones that are like, and if, if you can't be a non threat on offense anymore, it used to be, you could hide like a one player who was just focused on defense or one player who just wanted to pass. You used to be able to, to hide, you know, those players you could put on the floor. It's very hard to put anyone on the floor now who can't do multiple things. Um, and yeah, the players you mentioned, they all, they all are, um, they all are like that. They're all, they're all set up for the modern game. The ones you mentioned. Is there any chance that the, the league will revert back to big men, you know, as everybody's doing these, this mm-hmm. three point shooting and, and, and you, you put two seven footers, or, you know, two seven footers and a six foot ten person or a seven point three person. We saw Bol Bol has got like that kid can it's I mean, he's moving mm-hmm. like Porzingis like a little bit and he's got they have ball handles now, seven footers with, with a ball handle. It's really crazy to watch. Is somebody gonna fr- could, what would happen if somebody put, you know, you had obviously small ball and, and you, you crush teams with it. Is, is there a possible of doing like big ball where you put three seven footers or two seven footers and a six ten person in the front line? Yeah, I love that. I love that you said that. I do think our game's dynamic like that. And absolutely, you know, for a while we had Dwight Howard and Omer Oshik, and we started both of them in a playoff game one time. Um, and yeah, I think you, you win in the NBA through your, either your efficiency of your shots or getting extra shots. And ah. a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the recent era has been on more efficient shots and the skill and everything involved. And, Someone's gonna someone's gonna focus on generating extra shots. Generating extra shots actually more impactful. It's just hard to do on a consistent basis. And someone's gonna do what you said. We've dabbled in it. And actually, our our the current Sixers team is is set up to to do things like that. We'll see. You know, we'll see. We're we're gonna do whatever it takes to win. Doc's gonna figure that out. But um, there are different ways to win. And yeah, I love what what you said. There's been. There's been successful multi-big lineups to counter some of the smaller lineups, yes. Well, I mean, it, the extra shot comes from the extra rebound, am I correct? And correct, the, yeah, yeah, or, or steals. Or a putback. Uh, yeah, so let's offensive rebound is a putback. And then, yes, or, or generating more possessions through steals. Not possessions, more more plays, more shots through steals. So. Who, who's the so. best defensive player in the last 20, 30 years? Hmm, what a good question. Uh, Kevin Garnett, I think, is... Pretty easily the best, yeah. Yeah, and he was underappreciated. That's that's how the Celtics got him. Uh, I think he was underappreciated as how good of a defender he was. There, I believe the defense Doc and Kevin Garnett and that team put on the floor in '08 is still the greatest defense relative to their era. That's was that the year? The was that the year that, they beat the Lakers? That's the year they won the finals. Yeah, yeah. No and yep. I, I was at that game. I knew Phil Jackson at the time, and he had hooked me up with it. And he was Phil Jackson was the GM or coaching at that time. He was coach the head up? coach of the. Lakers. He was the head coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, that was incredible to watch. You had Rondo, um, Garnett. <laughs> um, Pierce. Who was there? Who was Paul the other? Paul, Paul Pierce, Pierce who's yeah. a grinder. That guy, he plays poker too. I haven't played with him. Yeah. But he, Ray he Allen, was, Ray and, Allen and you had and, Ray uh, Allen for the three. And that was like one of, that would be that construction of a team where you could hide maybe bad shooters. Rondo was a bad shooter at the time. But you mm-hmm. had this collection of like, they reminded me a little of the Knicks. They were kind of gnarly on defense. Yeah. Yeah. Your Knicks team were a little overrated. Sorry to tell you. But like, you know, they did. Why did we get so far every year? <laughs> was it just our heart? <laughs> he didn't win. He didn't win, just like the Rockets. It's all about rings, Jason. So, but we got to two. <laughs> we got to two finals. Yeah, <laughs> Houston. And we, we almost, and we, we. I mean, think about that. We, we got to multiple eight. conference finals, which is like the Western Conference Finals is basically the finals over the. It is true. Period. It is true. Yeah, all so. right. Uh, I'll end on this. My Greek brother Giannis. What's the upside on him? What's the upside on him? He, he, he all you two years ago, nobody could stop talking about him and Porzingis, and I don't even hear him getting brought up as much anymore. Well, I think incorrectly, people are focusing on the playoffs. There, I get, I get it, but uh, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, he's he's MVP, so I don't, I don't, yeah, for a reason. So I think, yeah. uh, I think his upside is pretty good. 
<laughs> what does he so. need to what does he need to add to his game to be really like lebron level elite you know to get into that sort of category i mean he's i mean lebron's his own special category okay uh yeah he's he he's there he's 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 good i think it's you know again he's he's super young so it takes a few times like you know you go back to jordan i think it was like his fifth or sixth time in the playoffs before they won so how excited are you for this season and this opportunity yeah extremely i mean it's i mean I, i'm sort of pinching myself normally when you step away you're away for a while and normally you don't get to be in a situation as good with you know two superstars in their prime and a great roster around it so uh, i'm I very mean, excited and you've got a great coach yeah and doc just to be reunited with him is, is, is why incredible. is doc so good what why i mean do people he seems to, i mean just as my outside you're the insider from my outside perspective it seems like he connects with the players and they trust and listen to him am i correct that he as a, a former player and as just in some way he seems very raw in like when i saw him commenting on black lives matter and some of this stuff he he seems to be the real deal in just in terms of connecting and the humanity he has. He drips humanity to me. Am I correct? Yeah, I think you nailed it. I think you you've seen these leaders in in the Bay Area as well. Yeah. The ones who can attract talent and then they want to run through walls for them. Those are that's a pretty remarkable skill, and I think Doc has that. And he's shown that multiple times over his career. Is that a function of he just spends the time with everybody? Like has the dinners you know, plays cards, whatever they, whatever NBA players are doing. Is it that you just have to spend that time and build that deep relationship with them so that when they're on the court and you're in this peak moment, you, you've got that fabric? I think he's extremely intelligent and he's a former player so he can connect. And then yeah. on top of that, he studied leadership. Like whenever ah. I talk to him, he's like, you know, I talked to Barack Obama, you know, I talked to, you know, so he's, he's one of these guys who's always learning and always picking things up from some of the great and he has more access to these great people than you or I do as well. I mean, it's, sure it's, actually, is, yeah. it's actually incredible is his, uh, his Rolodex and the people he's learned from. All right, listen, Daryl, I could talk to you for hours and I did. I talked to you for 75 minutes and you're, you're getting ready for the season. So I really appreciate it. I'm going to bust my ass. This is my promise to you. I am going to bust my ass for the next 10 years, investing in a hundred companies a year. I need, somewhere between seven and 15 more ubers and robin hoods <laughs> and then i have the potential potential to get dolan to sell me the knicks and if i can do that i'm sliding into your dms i'm texting you you're my guy <laughs> i, well, that's, I appreciate this is, it that's what well, this is about after uh, multiple sixers titles <laughs> absolutely so. When you're done with the Sixers, I'm going to be sitting there five, six rows back. I'm going to let you run the team however you want because you are the greatest. Watching what you did in terms of the collection of stars and the performance and the winning percentage and the bullshit you had to deal with and how you fought through it, you have my respect. And it's just, I'm in awe of what you did with Houston Rockets. I cannot wait to see what you do with Simmons and Embiid. So congratulations. It's great to know you. I appreciate it, Jason. Thanks for having me on. It's, really, it's an honor. I appreciate it.